I'm pleased to have with me today Dr. Felipe de Brigard. He is a professor of philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience at Duke University, where he runs the Imagination and Modal Cognition Lab and does research combining philosophy of mind with neuroimaging research. Uh, very cool stuff. Dr. De Brigard, um, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. So I saw that you are formally trained in philosophy and only later you, you came into doing neuro neuroscience research. Is that correct? Sort of. So uh, yes, that's, that's basically the background. I have, um, I'm from originally from Bogota, Colombia, uh, where I did my, my undergrad. And, uh, and my undergrad was primarily in philosophy, but I took a bunch of electives in uh, psychology and more specifically in neuropsychology. Uh, we don't have uh, double majors, but it, it, it was sort of equivalent to, to getting a double major in philosophy and in neuropsychology. Um, so I have been interested in neuropsychology for a very, very long time. I thought neuropsychology was the strategy for me to really be able to, um, from a scientific perspective, understand how the mind and uh, the brain will relate to one another. I didn't know anything about cognitive neuroscience at the time, um, nor was it an option at all for me at the time either. Um, so after that, I did a, a master's in philosophy and in cognitive science at Tufts University. And then that's where like cognitive neuroscience opened up as a possibility. Uh, and I was very lucky to do a PhD, which was at UNC um, in Chapel Hill, uh, where my advisors and my professors allowed me to basically do a dual degree in philosophy and in cognitive neuroscience. And that's how I ended up merging both of them. How did that education compare to a, a traditional cognitive neuroscience degree? Um, like, is it, is it more theoretical? Uh, that's a good point because the program, I basically made it myself uh, mm -hmm. and it was based uh, a lot on my own interests. I have always had um, kind of like a dual perspective on pretty much everything that I do in which you need to really know a whole lot about experimental design, about statistical methods. You really need to know the minutia of conducting experiments in cognitive neuroscience or in cognitive psychology. But at the same time, you really need to have an eye on the broader picture. And the broader picture is often confused and messy. Um, so the I feel that the philosophical training enabled me to feel that home with the psychological confusion or the, rather the conceptual confusion that you have at this more general broad field because that's what we do in mm -hmm. philosophy right we traffic right. in conceptual confusion we're experts and that's our day-to-day -day. so mm -hmm. that made um that made me more like at home in that when you step back and say like this is this is very complicated and at the same time was extremely helpful in in helping me clarify um at the level of the minutia with the experimental design, like what is it exactly what we're manipulating? Is this a direct manipulation of this variable or it is an indirect manipulation of that variable and so forth and so forth. So, um, so I, I would say philosophy is imbued in everything that I do through and through, no matter the level of generality. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that, especially in fields like neuroscience and physics too, that it seems like many people are drawn to it specifically because they have philosophical interests in, in either consciousness or, or maybe metaphysics in the, in, uh, in the case of physics. Um, but then there's another camp of people who are more interested in sort of like maybe in neuro, the, the medical side or, or more practical interventions rather than like what is consciousness or what is, what is thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. It is, um, in my case, I, I mean, I'm interested in so far as I'm interested in the mind in general in, in medical and possible clinical applications. But one thing I knew for sure after I was done with my undergrad degree is that I did not want to be a clinician. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the path that was open up to me, which was the sort of, uh, we're talking about 20 years ago, um, the path that was open up to me if I wanted to continue doing neuropsychology was a practical path it was a path to become a clinician to become the neuropsychologist working at a hospital and so forth um and what i had at the time in terms of idea of a theory was more philosophy 
I didn't think that there was a possibility of being like a theoretical psychologist or a theoretical neuroscientist. That was not mm. uh, uh, one of the, of the options, but that's what I wanted. So I, it, I sort of stumbled upon exactly what I do nowadays by way of combining uh, an, an, an interest in theoretical aspects that came from philosophy and, and, uh, and uh, as well as an aversion to being a clinician. <laughs> Mm -hmm. When you were applying to PhD programs, were you set on merging philosophy and, and cognitive neuroscience in the way you did? Or was it mostly cognitive neuroscience and then the program you just ended up at was particularly unique and that it offered both? I think it's a little bit of both. So I knew that the kind of philosophy of mine that I wanted to do was not, should not be, or, or, or I thought at that time, it, it couldn't be completely a priori. Uh, I, I was um, sort of rebelling myself, if you want, against certain traditions in philosophy. Uh, there is tradition in philosophy called analytic philosophy in which uh, sort of the strategy is instead of talking about the things themselves, you talk about how we talk about those things themselves. And then you hope that clarification at the level of language is going to bring clarification at the level of the thing itself. Um, and I was... Uh, first in love, with, in love with that tradition, and then I started to sort of reject that tradition myself uh, for a variety of reasons. First of all, I didn't see um, clearly that there was any progress being made. Second, um, I was seeing that it was uh, pretty Anglo-Saxon heavy, uh, and uh, um, it really sort of hinged a lot on what words were used in English, what expressions were used in English. And it was like, look, there are like thousands of languages out there. Like the truth cannot be in English, right? Uh, so, so then there was that component to it as well. Um, and then there was the other component, which is that sometimes the, whether philosophers wanted it or not, um, there are things that they were saying had implications empirical implications, that is to say, they had, they were saying things, they were claiming things about the way the world is, that were just plainly false, they might work, you know, or falsifiable in the sense that the, you might say such and such is the case, and then you get a psychiatrist that tells, well, I actually have two patients that go against your claim, or a neuropsychologist or neurosurgeon that said, like, this is very likely not true. So I thought, mm -hmm. um, you know, doing a thing at Priora is going to be extraordinarily unsatisfactory to me. Um, I really think that philosophy of mine need to pay very careful attention to the sciences. Uh -huh. uh, so, so that's sort of what happened at that point in which I was thinking, and that this is when I was in grad school, uh, and I was thinking, well, I really need to, paying attention to the sciences means more than just reading the abstracts of a, of a handful of papers. Uh, or even just the discussion sections of how, it means knowing the science. Um, and during grad school, that became ever so more clear to me um, that I didn't want it to be an empirical philosopher in the sense that I read a bunch of abstracts and then I just uh, regurgitate what other scientists say is I'm going to be a critical thinker of the science itself. Um, and then at that point, so I was sort of critical of philosophy of mind and an analytic tradition, and it started to being very critical also of certain aspects of conducting um, psychological research and, uh, and cognitive scientific research. So, so that's sort of how it has evolved. And, and right now I do what I do, which is kind of like a philosophy of both. Yeah, it seems like experimental philosophy has been on the rise within the past 20 years. Do you know much about it? I mean, I know it definitely um, has been on the rise in the case of philosophy of mind sort of merging with psychology and neuroscience, but what about other areas of philosophy? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I, you know, as, as, as it happens when, um, when you're in school, you're profoundly influenced by certain professors that you, that you have. And the year I started grad school, um, I started working under a professor called Jesse Prince, but also there was another professor called Josh Nob, who is a uh, very, very important figure in experimental philosophy. It was his first year as an assistant professor at UNC, and it was my first year as a graduate student. And um, it just opened up an entirely new way of thinking about doing philosophy, in which you could be an empirical philosopher if you want, uh, but you don't have to wait until the psychologists 
do the study that you really want to run. Actually, you can run the study. And that one was a, a, a really sort of eye-opening, mind-opening, <laughs> if you want, uh, experience in which, in which I thought this is the way to go. But um, now fast forward that a couple of years and it turns out that my interests also started changing and then so forth as I became really interested in memory and I became really interested on sort of more cognitive and less social aspects of um, research in the mind. It became pretty clear that I needed to move away from social psychology methods alone like vignette studies and correlation studies of that sort and that I really wanted to get more into cognitive science, like pure methods of cognitive science. So in a sense, and also in cognitive neuroscience. So in a sense, you can think of me as, as an experimental philosopher that, um, you know, I on occasion use methods of social psychology, but for my, my for the most part, my interests are much more local on cognitive architecture. Uh, and as a result, I employ more psychometric methods or more methods in pure ingrained in cognitive science and in cognitive neuroscience. Yeah, that's a great segue into your current research. So how did you first become interested in imagination and counterfactual thinking and, and the stuff you're currently working on? Okay, so I have been interested in memory uh, pretty much all my life. And primarily, I see myself still as a memory researcher. Um, and my interest in imagination and in counterfactual thinking actually stem from my interest on memories and specifically stem from my interest in uh, the systematicity of false recollection. So um, I have been, you know, sort of flabbergasted or, uh, or my maybe a bit better way of putting it is in awe of the fact that we remember. For me, it seems just so bizarre that, uh, th that, that memory even exists. We're like, very present oriented, like why should memory exist? Uh, so I was very interested on, on like, how do we come to evolve the kinds of memory that we have? And that, that, that thinking about, about uh, the evolution of memory just led me to think, sort of to realize, well, this memory seems to malfunction all the time according to philosophers, because you know, uh, philosophers would think that when, whenever you remember something that is not true or that it is not accurate and this does not portray the past in the way in which it worked is because um, either your memory is malfunctioning or because uh, you're mistaking an imagination for a memory, which is just another way of thinking that there is a memory process that is malfunctioning. And I thought that this just sucks because then that just means that our memory is just constantly malfunctioning. And it goes against everything that we know in evolution, right? Like most things need to be functioning relatively well most of the time, because otherwise, why wouldn't, why would we have it, <laughs> right? If it's constantly. So um, that just sort of led me to think, well, we, we should think about memory errors, not as errors, but as uh, maybe a byproduct of something else altogether. And that just sort of led me to think about uh, sort of, ways of thinking about false memories that were not really taken as errors, but rather as just the product of a system that might be doing something else. And it's not doing reproduction, it's doing something that is not exactly reproduction, it's close to reproduction, but it's not exactly reproduction. And then this sort of errors are, are just the byproduct of this system. But then what would that system be doing if not reproducing a previous experience? Um, and that sort of led me to uh, this beautiful research on the relationship between autobiographical episodic memory and episodic future thinking about how the same sort of cognitive and neural mechanisms that we have to remember, uh, that we employ to remember our past, that are also sort of redeployed when we think about our possible future. And, uh, and that right there, that word possible just open up uh, this sort of can of worms because possibility in, in philosophy is a modal term. That is to say, it's a term about how things could be or necessarily have to be or contingently could be. This opens up like this huge uh, can of worms. And I thought, well, maybe our memory system is just part of this more general system in which uh, we entertain hypothetical events. And, uh, and maybe false memories are something like an unconscious counterfactual. Your memory system is not delivering what actually happened, 
but it is just giving you what it is more likely that could have occurred certain, in certain circumstances. And that's what led me to start thinking about the relationship between counterfactual thinking and memory is like, to what extent um, our memory system defaults to sort of counterfactuals when it is trying to deliver what, uh, what the event in the past was. So that's sort of the connection. False memories and counterfactuals just led me naturally to, to think about uh, memory as being embedded in a much larger system for hypothetical thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely want to return to this, but it also got me thinking about memory's connection to consciousness because it seems like to have sort of a, a continuous sense of self that requires memory because I, I can't think of what it would mean to to be conscious or to, to be yourself, but have no memory because you could imagine just instant to instant well, everything's changing unless you have, I guess, a memory to, to keep things together. What do you think about that? Um, I think that there is a question as to whether it is memory that does that continuity. I definitely don't think that individuals that have amnesia are not selves, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely think that there is a self in there for sure. Uh, so, so it depends on, I guess, it depends on what exactly you mean by memory there. If there is if by memory you mean something extraordinarily general that, that, that basically encompasses a sense of continuity through time, of psychological continuity through time, it is very likely that it is uh, very, required, very much required for there to be a self. But notice that when I say through time, I'm not specifying the length of that time. Right. Maybe all you need for there to be a self is a working memory, uh, right? Mm -hmm. There is time already being... Yeah, I should have specified working that, memory. working memory, yeah. because even, yeah. even amnesiacs have working memory capacity, but I'm imagining without that, then I don't know how you'd be able to do anything. Uh, well, you would be surprised, number one, for how many things you are able to do that are outside the scope of your immediate attention. Uh, so so there, is, there is that one component, and I think that it might be possible that there is a self also in um, what in the past people call procedural or, or even uh, uh, non-declarative memory, right? So that's one possibility that, that we just have to broaden our scope of what uh, constitutes the memory upon which our self is, is grounded to include memory processes that aren't necessarily conscious. Uh, so that, that's one, one bit of the answer. And then the second bit of the answer is, um, you know, the view that memory is that is what underwrites our personal identity through time, is 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 a very old and uh, a very old and, and important view in philosophy. People tend to link it up to uh, Locke's view of personal identity. But even if you read Locke, Locke, Locke never said that it was memory what underwrote your your self through time. He talked about the self as being extended as long as your consciousness extended back in time, right? Uh, and and uh, Locke had a particular view about what consciousness, um, the, the role of consciousness in your mind, because specifically for Locke, it was inconceivable to think of there being unconscious ideas. So, so his, his thought was like, if you have a train of ideas, the, the notion of train of ideas actually is not his, it's from Hume, comes later on. But his thought was, uh, um, if you can extend your consciousness, and by consciousness he meant something very specific about uh, the about ideas, but if you can extend your consciousness back in time, that is a, is you know what underwrites your identity of the self through time. People later on interpret that what he meant to say was that memory, but. If you interpret at that face value, the importance is the extension of that consciousness. What is the nature of that consciousness is, is, is up in the air. It's still an open question. Mm -hmm. But a possible answer to that came, which I, I'm sort of very happy with, I guess, is William James's response to Locke and, and Hume. So, so here is basic, the cartoon version of what James does, which is, so you might remember uh, the, the metaphor of the stream of consciousness. The reason why, and that comes from James, and the reason why he thought that it was better to think of consciousness uh, as, as a stream was in, in, in contraposition to the previous sort of view of consciousness as a train of thought, which was uh, a Humean expression. And so like, look, our thoughts are never like trains. You don't have them 
you know, discrete portions of thoughts, our experience is never discrete in that sense. Our experience is, mm -hmm. is continuous. It's like a stream. Every wave has a little bit of the water that just came and a little bit of the water that is about to come. And the same for the self. So for Hume, uh, sorry, for James, the self was this continuous thing. He didn't think like Hume that when you are thinking about the self, you don't find anything. There is no idea of the self. No, no, no. James thinks the self is that continuity in the stream of consciousness. Whether it's underwritten by memory or not, it is, you can call it like that, but then you're just, just extending memory to just basically mean continuity of consciousness through time, which might not be what you want to do. So the self is underwritten by this continuity. How long the time should be? Maybe as short as working memory. What uh, do you think of sleep? Well, that's, that was one of the main problems for, for uh, Locke, right? Uh, so, so that means I go to bed. I'm, not uh, I'm going to bed. I'm not a self. I wake up. I'm a self again. Um, <laughs> and uh, in fact, Leibniz hated that claim. He thought that a very obvious argument for there being uh, ideas that were unconscious, contrary to Locke, is the fact that when you go to every, he, he believed in what is called the principle of sufficient reason, namely that after each cause, there is an effect and each effect is completely determined by the previous cause. So he thought, well, when you go to bed uh, and you lose consciousness, there are still these ideas that are lurking and doing causes and effects. And then the first idea that you have when you wake up is itself the effect of a previous idea that you had when you were unconscious. So the, basically what happens is that you're having all these ideas and then yeah, sure, you're aware of some of them, uh, but, but when you're asleep, you're not aware of many of them, maybe in your dreams and so on and so forth. So for, um, for Leibniz, for instance, there was continuity of ideas because there was co and continuity of self because there is always a continuity of ideas whether you're aware of them or not. So sleep is not a problem for him. Yeah, it sounds like the ideas of, of the train of thought and the stream kind of converge. It just depends on, you could imagine each little droplet of water in a continuous stream could could basically be a train. It's just looking at it from a different perspective. But I guess yeah. it, the, the fundamental question is still whether whether there are these discrete, discrete units of conscious experience or if it can be something that's uninterrupted. Correct. But I think that James's point was, where is your, ev where are you drawing your evidence? to the effect that experience is discrete versus continuous. And mm -hmm. his thought is, you're not drawing it from your experience itself because your experience does not come to you as drops, right? There is no point in which uh, you, you don't have this uh, stepwise or, 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 or this interrupted flow of consciousness. That's not at least how I experience myself, James is gonna say. So if your main source of evidence that your experience uh, is um, a train of thought comes from it actually not being a train of thought, but actually being a stream, being continuous, then you might be actually artificially uh, segregating the contents of your consciousness. It might fit your theory, but uh, you might have theoretical reasons as to why you want to segregate the elements of content, but you don't have phenomenological reasons to have to do that. Uh -huh. What does modern neuroscience have to say about this? Because we, we have a continuous stream of neurons firing and we even have a resting brain state. But then on the other hand, it seems like each thought we have or each action that's produced is, is kind of met by a burst of, of firing, more, almost more like a discrete unit. Yeah. You know, you are putting the finger in, in something that I think is fundamental to our understanding of, of uh of really how to deal with the relationship between the mind and the brain. Um, I, and I, you know, to lay down my cards on the table, I, another big influence in my life has been the phenomenological tradition like Husserl and Merleau-Ponty. Uh, people don't know this that much about me, but when I was an undergrad, I read a bunch of Husserl and, and I do take uh, the phenomenology and the, the stream of consciousness in our phenomenology as, as being an extremely powerful um, a source of, of, of evidence as to how your conscious experience really is, right? Mm -hmm. and could you briefly uh, define phenomenology for our listeners? Yeah, so phenomenology is often understood as, uh, the, as pertaining to the experience that you're having as of living in the world, if you, if you want. So when I, 
uh, drink my cup of coffee? Like, how does it taste? You know, like that the genus equad that comes from good cup of Colombian coffee. That is that is the phenomenology, right? But phenomenology also means uh, a school of thought that was sort of uh, spearheaded by Edmund Husserl um, and that for, to which it belonged, um, among others, uh, um, uh, Heidegger and, and, uh, and then many other thinkers like Merleau-Ponty are associated with phenomenology. And uh, Heidegger's, sorry, Husserl's idea was that, um, you know, that sort of Descartes almost got it right. So Descartes said like, you, when you have your method, you bracket, that's the expression that, that Husserl uses, epoche, you bracket the external world and then you study your, um, your experience of the world, right? So, so you, you build the world back as it were, but you have to first analyze your experience of the world. So putting the world on brackets in epoche and just analyzing the experience as a philosophical method is what, um, what phenomenology as a philosophical method means. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it right to say that in addition to only looking at kind of empirical facts as, as modern science does, phenomenologists look at qualia as like fundamental properties of existence? Uh, you don't need to be committed to the existence of qualia to be a phenomenologist. Uh, that is that. So qualia is the plural for quali, quali being the unit uh, a postulated unit of quali qualitative experience, right? So the idea is maybe you, something like this, you, you experience certain coffee as more bitter than another coffee. And then you say, well, maybe it's because the, the coffee that is more bitter than the other coffee has more quali, more qualia units of bitterness than the uh, coffee that is less bitter. And then somehow you can quantify uh, the, the amount of qualia that, that you have, because why? Because there are units uh, of experience. So um, you could be, uh, you could think of, and then there's, there are people that believe that there is such a thing as qualia and that those qualia are, for instance, irreducible in the sense that they cannot be explained by, uh, by neuroscientific terminology or, or it cannot be uh, you know, subsumed uh, by theories that only involve neuroscientific data and so forth and so on. But the truth is that um, you don't need to postulate the existence of qualia to be a phenomenologist. Uh, you can totally think of them as, uh, as these qualitative states as an, an instrumental terms. You don't, you, I mean, it's, in other words, they're orthogonal to one another. One could be a, a, a phenomenologist without having to be committed to the existence of anything like qualia. Okay, that, that's still a bit confusing to me, maybe because I, I had put those two terms together uh, in my mind in the past. So what does it mean to, to be a phenomenologist, but not focusing on qualia? No, you can focus on qualia. The point is you don't or have not, to well, think it, of it as being existing, right? Yeah, you can... first, I guess, what would you be focusing on as, what would the phenomenal experience be if not qualia? Uh, well, it would be, the, a qualitative experience that could, and that there are people that work in these terms that could very easily be explained in neuroscientific terms as well, right? There are people uh, like there is a philosopher who's also a big influence on, on me, is called Evan Thompson, um, who uh, is in a sense sort of phenomenologist, but you can also just see your phenomenology, like the experience uh, of your conscious experience of the world, your conscious experience of, of living in the world um, as being the product of this very interesting and intricate patterns of, uh, neur of neural information, right? So there is no, uh, there is no magic uh, going on between the neurons and the experience. That is all that there is to it, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that you are going to dismiss the importance of the, of the experience that is produced by uh, or is correlated with this neuronal firings and what have you, uh, because they constitute your way of understanding what's going on. So a very good example for you of, of what you at the point that you that you just pointed out. So um, um, if your experience is continuous in the way in which you're saying is if like there is um, only artificial ways in which you can determine when a thought has stopped and another thought has started, right? Um, well, that's something that you 
you need to take into account when you're trying to understand what the neural correlates of a thought are, right? Maybe you, you're not going to find anything that it is going to be fully discrete uh, in the brain because maybe it's an artificial distinction to say that my thought of P is uh, completely discreetly different from my thought of Q, or mm -hmm. as philosophers like to say, my thought of P at T1, at time T1, is different mm -hmm. from my thought of P at time T2. Like, why? Like, when? Right? Is that your experience? To, like, think about it when you think about uh, your own conscious experience. Um, can, you, can you have two thoughts at the same time? Is one of the thoughts longer than the other thought? Um, can you stop thinking one thought and continue thinking the other thought? Right? Mm -hmm. So, so when you when you think about how messy um, and uh, and you know like like a stream I like the stream of consciousness for that like like and like waves that come and go mm -hmm. some are bigger some are not some are inside the, so forth uh, then you start thinking about well I think I should take this very clearly seriously if I am trying to understand how this mess that the mind is correlates to this other mess that the brain is mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense so multitasking then. Is, do you know if, if there's a, a strong camp for something like you can multitask or another camp that might say something like what you're really doing is focusing on one thing at a time. It's just at incredibly high speed. So it seems like you're, you're multitasking to you. Uh, you know, there are those two camps. And, uh, and there are, as, as, as it usually happens, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, so like there, exclusive options <laughs> not necessarily I, and in fact some of uh, my favorite work in this uh, kind of um, multitasking as you call it which is uh, what some others call cognitive control mm -hmm. comes uh, from John Cohen's work uh, at Princeton so John, uh, Jonathan Cohen has been doing a lot of work on, on uh, cognitive control and then he has beautiful experiments showing for instance how you can multitask uh, when, they're, when the two tasks um, have uh, the very different modalities, um, but you cannot multitask when they share modality. Uh, and this doesn't have even to do with resources that much. Um, I think that the part of the explanation has to do with like the way that our body is organized. Like, so, so one thing that is extremely difficult for you to do is to remember an, uh, the tune of a song while singing another one. You try, it's super complicated. It's very, very difficult. So it looks as though some of the machinery gets employed for those tasks, but you can uh, totally remember how to throw a ball when you're singing a, a song. In fact, you can draw when you're singing a song, right? So there is mm -hmm. some multitasks that are easier to do than others. Might not have to do with memory, just might have to do with just the way we're wired, right? Uh -huh. If you had two mouths, maybe you could be able to entertain two thoughts much more clearly and, and have two independent streams of, of verbal consciousness uh, but it's because the way in which we're wired that we have to bottleneck certain things and some others don't so that's the middle that I was trying to get at yeah that that makes sense and I think this would be a good tie-in back to to your current work because uh, multitasking could not only be in the moment but it could involve many layers of of temporality so you could be doing one task while thinking about what you have to do in five minutes or five seconds or five hours from now and well, I, I guess that relates to imagination, but I'm wondering the way you define imagination, is that any different from something like prediction or imagining future possibilities? Like, is there a distinction between those two? Oh yeah, for sure. There are lots of distinctions between, between uh, them. Imagination is, is an extraordinarily complex term, way more so than memory, I would think. Um, there is, you know, there are lots of things that we call imagination that are likely, um, subserved by not only different brain structures, but also that involve different um, cognitive processes, if you want. So pretend play is a kind of imagination that it is very likely different from imagining what you would have done um, differently in a, in a task that you just erred at or that you, you just did something wrong. Right. Uh, so when, when you're so soccer, sorry, I, I really like soccer. So you're, you're, you're a soccer player and you missed uh, a, a penalty kick, the amount of contrafactual thinking that goes in your mind voluntarily or involuntarily is exorbitant. It's just, you cannot help but replay this subjunctive instant replays in your mind <laughs> of what you would have done, like, or should have turned, like, you know? 
that kind of imagination seems very different from uh, the kind of imagination that you engage when you're playing Dungeons and Dragons with your friends, right? So that that seems uh, seems different. Um, planning and imagining the future also seems very different, right? Uh, spoiler alert: I don't want to do, uh, but if you have seen Loki, the 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 new uh, TV show, there was an awesome line in the last episode in which. Um, Loki was with one of his alternates and the alternate uh, said, uh, do you have a plan? And Loki said, yes, I have a plan. And then he just basically morphed into someone else. And she said, uh, that's not a plan. That's just the thing you do. And, and I, I thought that this is a, it was a brilliant line because th there's a huge difference between planning and imagining the future, right? I sometimes imagine the future is just like sort of daydreaming that I am, you know, behind a desk with a bunch of money or something like that. Uh, but actually to get there, the planning involves something altogether very different. Um, so you might call them all the same. I'm imagining my future, but definitely exactly what you're doing is a very different kind of process. And the philosophers have done quite a bit of interesting, important and serious work on, on distinct kinds of imaginations. And for sure, memory is not equally deployed in all of them. Yeah. And what about in your own lab? In my lab, uh, that people are working on this sort of things? Yeah. Um, well, to a certain extent, we do. So not so much for future planning, uh, but for counterfactual thinking. So uh, I think counterfactual thinking is not a unitary process that there are different kinds of counterfactual uh, thoughts that you can engage, and some of them are more or less lenient on episodic memory or on semantic memory. So thinking what you could have done in a particular uh, very concrete situation in your, in your life is very different from imagining what would have happened had a different presidential candidate being elected. It is very different to imagine uh, in, uh, in vignette kinds of scenarios. Uh, and part of that is because some, some of those thoughts are likely going to require more or less uh, background information. And if the background information requires autobiographical information from your personal past, then you're going to deploy certain kinds of uh, memory resources to engage in that mental simulation. But by contrast, if they are more required, like some semantic information then they could deploy differently. So um, we study a little bit of those varieties of counterfactual thoughts, if you want. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of planning, uh, one of my postdocs, his name is Sam Murray. Uh, Sam uh, does uh, a little bit of work on, on what he calls the vigilance, which is a kind of cognitive control, but more protracted. So uh, sometimes in cognitive control, you, when you're doing a task, you like really have to pay a whole lot of attention, sustain attention, but for very brief periods of time. But there is uh, lots of tasks that require you to remember what you need to be doing for a protracted period of time, for hours, like looking at radars, for instance, uh, right? Or uh, in which you have to be vigilant for a protracted periods of time. Um, and that seems to require a kind of cognitive control that is different from like the cognitive control of the Stroop test or stuff like that. So he is interested in those and on vigilance at la la protracted periods of time. Um, so those are some few varieties, if you want, of, of mental simulations that we study in the lab. Yeah, that you're currently studying or, or was this past work? Uh, both. We have done in the past and we're currently doing. So a lot of, now we have a study looking at, um, Counterfactuals about, uh, or what we call episodic counterfactuals, uh, in which you imagine what you could have done differently, versus when you imagine what uh, what could have occurred in the context differently for a particular mm -hmm. outcome to occur. This is a very old distinction in social psychology: uh, dispositional versus categorical. Uh, so we're sort of exploring that distinction in in uh, in the neuroscience of counterfactual thinking. We have done um, we have done a bunch of like exploring self versus other plausible versus implausible counterfactuals uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there there are differences in the way you think about things if you're imagining yourself in a scenario versus if you're just imagining some scenario that doesn't involve you. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, from the point of view of brain structures, there is no question about that. Uh, so counterfactuals that involve you or that involve people tend to 
recruit regions of the default network that are typically associated with like social cognition and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas uh, thinking counterfactually about objects, for instance, or semantic facts tend to recruit semantic networks that are not typically involved in social cognition. Mm -hmm. uh, you see with, with patients as well, individuals with temporal lobe damage have difficulty in engaging in certain kinds of counterfactuals that are, I would say are more that required uh, for the furnishing of that mental simulation required bringing back to mind episodes from their pasts or information that is episodic in nature. By contrast, they have no trouble engaging in counterfactual thoughts that um, do not require episodic information to be brought to mind, uh, but they can mm -hmm. just do as well with semantic memory. Does that have anything to do with emotion? Like the closer the closer the the hypothetical is to you, the more emotional uh, you, the the more em emotion might influence your decision making or your thought process. Not maybe, but depends on what you mean by emotion again. Mm -hmm. So like there's uh, some counterfactuals are highly emotional, positively, negatively. Uh, and uh, I bet that depending on your political orientation, engaging in some political counterfactuals might be more or less emotional. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah, so I, I, I think they're related, but emotion probably won't explain a lot of the effects that we find. Yeah, I guess I guess what I'm trying to get at here is a distinction between um, counterfactuals where you can purely use use your rationality at least to the best of your ability versus others that might stir you up and and lead to lead to a different outcome even if it's uh, may, maybe just because of because you're more attached and uh, because you're less able to to sort of just abstract the problem and distance yourself. Interesting. From it. I haven't thought in those terms. I, that, I mean, definitely there is a number of counterfactuals that I regret producing. Uh, I should have done this. I should have done this. Is 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 definitely very prevalent. Um, uh, we have a line of research uh, precisely doing research on counterfactual simulation in individuals with generalized anxiety disorder because uh, counterfactual rumination is 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 very um, sort of uh, highlighted in 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 individuals with anxiety. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, for sure. There is a number of counterfactuals that are highly um, prevalent and and uh, and uh, and that are associated with emotions. Um, some are positive emotions. To relief is typically a, an emotion that is elicited by um, counterfactual simulation. It's just that it is what they call a downward counterfactual, in which you imagine how something um, could have gone worse uh, mm -hmm. than it actually did, and people say sort of sort of sort that of like, relief. That's like a gratefulness technique. Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, some like that. So, so there is this phenomena that um, people that that win silver medals are uh, less happy than gold and, and bronze medalists. Uh, and the thought is that the silver medalists um, uh, does the upward counterfactual. Oh, I could have got the gold, whereas the bronze medalist does the downward counterfactual. And they're like, well, at least I'm in the podium, right? So, mm -hmm. so that gives a sort of a different flavor to it. Um, so emotion plays an extremely important role in counterfactual thinking, and there's a lot of individual differences and variability as to how exactly it features. Uh, it's just studying emotion as someone who arrived kind of late to the study of emotion is very tricky. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about this from an evolutionary perspective, like why we might have evolved the ability to think these what-ifs? Is it so you can modify your behavior in the future? Likely. Likely. I Well... Here is the thought. So the, the traditional view, if you want it, uh, I mean, in the counterfactual thinking literature, there's a, a, a very influential view put forth by uh, Neil Rose and, and, and Kai Epstead, uh, and then followed by a number of really amazing researchers like Rachel Smallman and Amy Somerville and a number of them. Uh, it's called the functional theory of counterfactual thinking. And according to that view, uh, the you know, the main goal is, is behavior modification. So you, um, I like to put it the way in which Hobbes uh, puts it. It's like, we generate hypotheses so that they can die in our stead. Um, and, uh, and I think that we engage in counterfactual thinking sort of with the same logic. So, so you rehash uh, ways in which the past could have occurred because the future is not, exactly how the past is, but it is more likely that the future might be like the way in which the past could have gone. Mm 
So you just broaden the number of possibilities so that you have a better chance of hitting what might happen in the future. So that's sort of the, the, the thought behind it. And of course, you need to rehash those, those uh, counterfactuals and then later on remember them uh, when the right time comes for the, you to deploy what you simulated uh, in the past. Um, so the functional view has sort of that idea that you imagine alternative ways in which the past could have occurred so that those um, memories of those mental simulations could be redeployed later on when they are useful. Um, that they, con they call that the content-based view uh, in which basically what helps you in the future is the content of the counterfactual that you simulated. There is another strategy that they called, um, I think the content independent, but it's more like mood related, which counterfactual also can help you at the time in which you're simulating it, right? So uh, um, if you're in a car accident and, uh, and, it was, and it was a car accident that very clearly could have gone much worse, you immediately make yourself feel better by engaging in the counterfactual of I could have been dead or I could have broken my arm or something like that, right? So you engage in that counterfactual and what that has is an immediate move repair function. So, so th that's another possibility that we engage in counterfactuals, not only for hedging future uncertainty, but also for mood repair at the time of the simulation. Mm -hmm. And I claim that there might be actually a third role that counterfactuals play in our life, which is what I call the mnemonic role of counterfactual thinking, which is to help us modify the memories that they are derived from. Uh, so why do we engage in counterfactual thinking likely serves a number of these functional roles. Uh -huh. What do you mean to modify the memories that they came from? So... Uh, you know all, a lot of this research on false memories in which people are asked to imagine um, possible things that could have happened to them and then later on uh, when they remember the memory they, that counterfactual actually had a sort of uh, uh, polluted if you want contaminated the original memory so mm -hmm. i i think that we often use counterfactuals to um, modify uh, uh, the the content of the original memory in an adaptive way, in a way that it is going to help the purpose later on. So we sometimes, a lot of my work has shown uh, that we engage sometimes in counterfactual thinking um, in a way that that modifies that that memory, but the memory gets reappraised and gets modified. And then later on say the memory doesn't hurt as much. So, uh -huh. so that's, that is uh, directly a memory modification via counterfactual simulation, I think. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So I want to close asking you about what would be like the holy grail in your field, a, ma a major research finding that you'd hope um, to, to see in, in, in your lifetime and what that would do for our understanding of, of the mind and of behavior. Wow, that's a difficult question. Well, I don't know if, what would be. There are lots of uh, things that could come to mind, but one question that I find extraordinarily difficult to answer uh, is what constrains the space of possibility when you think about counterfactuals, right? So mm -hmm. when you imagine what could have happened, there are certain things that come to mind and there are certain things that do not come to mind, right? Douglas Hofstetter, the, the classic cognitive scientists, uh, uh, makes it very clear in, 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 in the, his writing. So like when Suppose that you go to a pizza parlor and and someone gives and you get a, a slice of pizza and you accidentally dropped it. Your counterfactuals that come to mind automatically are things like, oh man, if only I had grabbed it harder, if only I had been able to like. But there are lots of other things that could have happened. If only the laws of gravity had changed in just this second, if only it had happened to the guy next door, right? Or uh, if only it was legally or socially acceptable to leak food off of the floor. Uh, <laughs> but those counterfactuals never come to your mind. And uh, he calls fault lines of imagination. What are the fault lines of imagination? Um, and this mm -hmm. problem of like, why do we explore this area of possibilities when we think counterfactually and not others that could as well being explored is a very difficult question. I think it is an unsolvable question yet or unsolved question in, in artificial intelligence and in artificial models of counterfactual thinking. Mm 
and and uh, and I and I I have seen the you know I'm a, a full shout out here is the work that Fiery Cushman and Jonathan Phillips have done on this is the most impressive work on how we close off uh, 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 the realm of possibilities and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and I don't think that they have solved the whole problem but I think that they have indicated which is the right way of thinking about all this problem. Um, so a solution to that would be, you know, extraordinarily heartbreaking. It might come from them, so for all I know. Uh, mm -hmm. That I would think is, for me, as, as a question that really interests me and, and that, that I am very invested in, that, that would be awesome. Yeah, that's very interesting. And it's one of those questions that, well, is super interesting, but I'm guessing most people haven't thought of it. But, but now I'm, 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 I'm just thinking about that example you gave and other examples. And yeah, that, that, would, that would be very interesting. Yeah. Dr. Debergard, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for interviewing me.